This is the city, Los Angeles, California. If you look hard enough, you can find the dreams of many men buried here. One such dream can be seen in the community of Venice. Millionaire manufacturer Abbott Kenny came to Los Angeles to investigate the plight of local Indians, and he stayed on. He founded the city of Venice in 1904. Wanting it to look like its namesake, he dug 16 miles of canals. And he stocked them with imported Venetian gondolas, complete with singing boatmen. To his dismay, Kenny found people were more interested in the beach than in his canals and his cultural buildings. Less than a year after its Independence Day christening, Kenny began turning his dream city into an imitation Coney Island. By 1930, most of the canals were filled on demand of the property owners. The remaining ones were drained. Everybody has their dreams. Some are looking for the material things, others just a long, healthy life. I work hard to give them an opportunity to pursue those dreams. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Wednesday, July 30th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch at the hospital detail out of detective headquarters. The boss is Captain Didion. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Among the duties of the hospital detail is the preliminary investigation of all police problems involving the mentally ill, amnesia victims, and alcoholics. 5.15 p.m., we received a phone call from Homicide asking us to check the files for a Fred W. Pick. He was believed to be mentally disturbed. He had written a letter threatening to blow up a local radio station. Yeah, that's right, Danny. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, our records go back five years. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we... Yeah, we got them on file. Yeah, that's right. What's that, Danny? Oh, we got it right here. Yeah, here you go. Pick, Frederick Waller. Psychopathic examination requested two years ago. He was 38 at the time. 38. Uh-huh. Violence involved. Beat up his brother for trying to get him deported as an undesirable alien. Yeah. No, I wouldn't think so. Both brothers were born in Montana. Yeah. We'll do that. Uh -huh. Okay, Danny. Right, boy. Bye. Did you ever hear of Eric Shafton, some guy on the radio? Sure. It's a talk show. You know, people phone in while he's on the air and make a beef. Oh, what about? Well, anything, Joe. Whatever happens to bug you, that's what you talk about. What does a Shafton do? Depends. Sometimes he agrees with the caller. Other times he sets them straight. Disconnected. Where's the upside down book? Bottom left. Surprised you never listened to Shafton, Joe. There's two or three other talk shows around, but for my money, he's the best. Why, does he get results? Well, no, he doesn't do anything except talk. Well, then? I guess it just gives you a chance to unload. You know how it is. You got a beef, you tell it to somebody, and you feel better. Didn't work that way with Fred Pick. He called Shafton, huh? The radio station. Now, he didn't get on the air. His beef was that Shafton had been talking about him every night. He wanted it stopped. Yeah. Station manager checked it out. Shafton says he never heard of Pick. Never used his name. Mm hmm That was two nights ago. Last night, they got another call. Final warning. Shafton does it again tonight. Pick will put him off the air. How does he figure to do that? With a gun. 5.28 p.m. We contacted Fred's mother, Mrs. Joseph Pick. She told us her son had left the house shortly after lunch to visit a friend in the Hollywood area. We obtained the name of the friend, Terry Welkin, and his phone number. After some hesitation, Mrs. Pick admitted that Fred had not been taking his medication and appeared somewhat disturbed, though not alarmingly so. 5.35 p.m. We phoned Terry Welkin. Mr. Welkin, this is Officer Gannon at Central Receiving Hospital. No, sir, nothing like that. We're just trying to locate Fred Pick. Fred Pick. I see. 
Mm-hmm. Well, did he seem all right? Well, now, you're an old friend of his, aren't you? Mr. Welkin, do you possess a gun of any kind? No, sir, do you own a gun? Well, all I'd like to know is if Fred wanted to borrow it, wanted to borrow your gun. Well, would you mind checking it anyway? Yes, sir, right now. Yeah, I'll hang on. Fred was there until about 4 o'clock, didn't say where he was going next. Yeah. Welkin said he was uptight, talked all the time, but nothing irrational. What kind of gun does Welkin own? 32. Yes, sir? I see. All right, Mr. Welkin, thank you for the help. Pardon? Well, that's hard to say. I'd only be guessing. Yes, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Welkin. Gun's gone, huh? 32 automatic, fully loaded. Yeah. Welkin doesn't think there's anything to worry about. He doesn't, huh? Admits Fred's a little strange, but claims he wouldn't kill a fly. Yeah, well, you don't kill flies with a 32 automatic. 5.40 p.m., the radio car in the area was dispatched to the Pick home to watch Fred and to obtain a complete description of him. This description was relayed to Hollywood Division, which dispatched a car to the radio station. Right. Sergeant Friday? Yeah, that's right. Quinn, 2L47? Yeah, Quinn. We got an old gentleman out here. Don't quite know what to do with him. What's the problem? Well, he's been in the lobby of the Biltmore Hotel since 8 o'clock this morning. Maybe earlier than that. But 8 o'clock's when somebody first remembers noticing him. He's noticeable. Just sitting there. Yes, yeah, sir. Didn't cause any trouble. But he'd been there over nine hours when the house man talked to him. You said he was noticeable? Yeah, he stands out even in a crowded lobby. When he talks, you think you're in the south of England. Is his name Jennings? I don't know. Neither does he. And he doesn't have any ID. At first, we thought he could show us where he lived. We drove him around for 20 minutes, but he didn't recognize anything. OK, bring him in. Mike, Officer Boyd, Sergeant Friday, Officer Gannon. Sit right down there, sir. This is the man I was telling you about. Hello there, Mr. Jennings. That's your name, isn't it? Basil Jennings? Is it? I really couldn't say. That's what it was the last time you were in here. I have no recollection of ever having been here before. However, I shall not dispute your word. You're a sitter, aren't you, Mr. Jennings? Uh, but it wasn't the Biltmore last time. The Sheridan, wasn't it? You have the advantage of me, sir. You still live at that board and care place over on South Union, do you? My address eludes me for the moment. I'm sure the constable here can verify that. Uh-huh. Bill, Quinn. Did you search him? Yes, yeah, sir. He's got 43 cents in his pocket and nothing else. It's Basil, all right, Joe. No doubt about that. Do you think he's faking? Well, maybe he had a slight stroke. That'll affect the memory, and he's the right age bracket for it. Better have Dr. Mackin take a look at him, huh? Right. You've had him before, huh? Oh, yeah. He's a regular. He sits around all the big hotel lobbies 12, 15 hours a day. When they ask him what he's doing there, he blows his stack and ends up here. <laughs> all right, Mr. Jennings, let's take a little walk. Where? Where are you taking me? I demand to know. We're going to have the doctor look you over, and if you're all right, you can go on home. How's that? Oh, very well, then. Sergeant, I do not require medical attention. I'm at the peak of health. You remember him, Bradley, the lobby sitter. Oh, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Jennings. Good afternoon. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine, fine, just like I've been telling him. Your cotton vest off, please. Madam, I am not wearing a vest. Well, if you are, it comes off. We're going to take your blood pressure. Young... All right, I can manage it. Young lady, I've been dressing myself unaided for three quarters of a century, and I shall continue to do so for some time to come. Good for you. Come on, don't be modest. Roll up your left sleeve. All right, leave me alone. I can do it. I've done it before. Now, how did that get way up there, do you suppose? I have no idea, sir. Basil R. Jennings, Seven Palms Rest Home, blood type AB. Had you fooled for a while, didn't I? Now, why would you do a thing like that? First of the month. How's that? First of the month. Pension checks just came in. Of course, the home always takes most of that, but there's nine dollars left over, so I have my little outing. You do. Hotel lobbies, the most fascinating places in the world. Railroad stations used to be. Blood pressure's fine. No, if you want to observe life, Sergeant, a hotel lobby is the place. Splendid drama. Every person you see is a story in himself. There's nothing wrong with your memory, is there? Put one over on the young man, didn't I? <laughs> Topped the day off with a ride in a police car. 
very exciting. I enjoyed it enormously. All right for Mr. Jennings to go home, Doc? Don't know why not. I'll call the rest home and have them come and get you. You're not mad at me, are you? No, not too mad. Thank you very much, Sergeant. See you the first of next month. <laughs> p.m. In another five minutes, the Eric Shafton talk show would be on the air. The black and white from Hollywood Division was standing by at the radio station. There had been no further report on Fred Pick. What's the matter? Lose something? No, caught something. What? Still too early to tell. Only started this afternoon. Itchy sensation, rash across the chest. Could be several things. Prickly heat, measles, scarlatina. Well, didn't you have measles when you were a kid? Yeah, I had the measles, Joe. German measles. Rubella, that's the medical term, but you can get it again, you know. Is that right? Absolutely. Don't let anybody tell you once you've had them, that's it. You can get it as often as it comes around. Well, are the German measles going around? Well, no, not that I've heard of, Joe. Well, then? That doesn't prove anything, Joe. These things have got to start someplace, don't they? Yeah, I guess so. On the other hand, it could be poison oak, except I haven't been around any of that. Well, now, you were just talking to Doc Mack, and why didn't you ask him? Well, Joe, all he could tell me at this stage is I have a rash. I already know that. Joe. Yeah? Tell me something. Anything. Now, be honest with me. I'll try. How long you been working hospital detail? Well, now, you ought to know that. We've been together. I know, but how many years has it been? Three. Three years. In other words, 36 months. That's the way it figures. In 36 months, haven't you picked up anything about medicine? Can somebody please help me? Yes, sir. What's your problem? I've got a woman out in the car. She's sick. Where is your car? It's out there by the ramp. Doc, sick woman in the car. Would you take a look? Your name, please? Brownlee, L-E-A. First name? Uh, George Brownlee. Address? 3942 and a half South 10th Street. Come on, she's passed out or something. She, anyway, she won't budge. Patient's name, please. I don't know. Well, it's your car, isn't it? Yeah, I hold a pink slip on it. Then what's a strange woman doing in it? I guess that seems kind of funny, don't it? Yeah, it does to me. What happened to this woman? This man says she passed out in his car. Passed out? I guess she's dead, huh? She has been for a long time. Is that a fact? Rigor mortis has set in. examination of the dead woman indicated she had died at least three hours earlier. Cause of death was unknown. 7.15 p.m. We took George Brownlee into room five to get a statement. All right, Brownlee, you want to tell us about it? Yes, sir. Start any time. I found her in the park. MacArthur Park, you know? Yeah. She was lying there in the grass. Hardly more than looked at her to start with. I figured she was there for the same reason all of us was, to find a breath of air. Sure was a hot day. Okay, Brownlee, you saw a lion in the park. Yes, sir, and that's a fact. And I seen these kids, too. Must have been four or five of them. Looked about 16, 17 years old. Big enough to do you a lot of mischief, if that's what they had in mind. And the way they was acting, I figured there was going to be trouble. Go on. Well, I went over and I told her. I said, Miss, you better get yourself out of this park, because whatever these kids are planning, it ain't going to be good for you. What time was that? Time? I couldn't honestly tell you that. Like maybe 3, 3.30, long in there. Was she alive then? Of course she was, man. She talked to me. Said she was ready to leave the park, but didn't think her legs was up to it. She'd been hitting the bottle real good. Go ahead. Well, I, I had nothing better to do, so I told her I'd drive her home. Got her in the car, but she passed out before she could tell me where to go. No, she didn't pass out, Brownlee. She died. Yes, sir, she did. I realize that now. Hospital detail, Friday. Uh-huh. Yes, sir, that's right. I see. Was there any trouble? No, sir. That's the right procedure. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Watch commander at Hollywood Division. Yeah? Fred Pick. They collared him at the radio station. They're bringing him over here. What about the gun? In his pocket. He never got to use it. Good. Brownlee, you spell that L-E-A? Yes, sir. I'll call R-9. He's running a make on me. That's right. Guess there ain't no cause to hold back, then. I got me a record. Burglary, two to five. I'm on parole. All right, now, do you want to make any changes in that story of yours? 
Might as well, I guess. Esther Lee Mayhew, that was her name. We was keeping company eight, nine months now. Met her the first week I got back from Vacaville. She was working at a bar then, but she had a problem. What kind of problem? Blank up the profits, man. She was a lush. Ain't no softer way of putting it. Just drank herself into an early grave. 34 years old. How did it happen, George? Maybe she got some bad booze. I don't know. We was up in the room, and all of a sudden she said, Lover, I don't feel good. Down she went. I tried to bring her around, but nothing happened, and I figured to get her to emergency here. We didn't make it. Yeah. She died right beside me in the car. Just gave a little gurgle, and I knew emergency would do her no good. I just drove her around. I don't know how long, three, four hours, maybe. Didn't seem to be no hurry. Sorry about that crud I give you first, finding her in the park, you know? Yeah. Dead woman in the car, me with a record. I figure it's got to bust my parole. Why'd you come here, George? Huh? Well, you could have put her in the park and driven away. No, sir, I couldn't have. I couldn't leave her in no park. Even if I got to go back to Vacaville, I couldn't have done that to her. We'll have to hold you until it's checked out. If she died of natural causes... She didn't. What's that? Somewhere along the line, she got hurt. You don't drink like she did, except as a painkiller. She never told me what it was. I never asked her. Yeah. I guess she died. Because it hurt too much to live. Eight ten p.m., the radio unit from Hollywood Division arrived with Fred Pick. He appeared calm. The arresting officer said he had freely admitted his identity and surrendered the gun without resistance. He remembered Bill and me. Well, hello there, Fred. How you doing? Fine, fine. No problem. Do we need the cuffs? Up to you, Sergeant. Let's take them off and talk a while. Fine, fine. No problem. Sit down. You want me to sit down? Yeah. Might as well. Can't stay very long, though. It's the old lady. You know, she gets worried if I'm out after dark. Yeah, we know. How have you been, Joe? You're looking very well. So do you, Bill. Feeling all right? Generally pretty good. Fred, now what's all this business with you and this Eric Shafton, the fellow on the radio? Oh, that. Well, don't worry about it, Joe. Just a misunderstanding. Nothing that can't be straightened out if he'll stop talking about me. I don't think that's asking too much, is it? He doesn't have any right to use my name on the air. That's a violation of my constitutional rights. You know that as well as I do, Joe, Bill. I don't like being violated any more than anybody else. And I know that I'm on solid ground there. I've taken it all the way to the Supreme Court. And they agree with me all down the line. Fred, I think I'm going to send you back to see your doctor, OK? A Camarillo? You ought to like it up there. It's nice grounds, a lot of fresh air. The place isn't too bad, but I don't like those shock treatments. Well, I hear they don't give shock treatments so much anymore. They're using medication now. Is that right, Joe? A patient can refuse shock treatment. That says so right here in the new Mental Health Act. And this is signed by the governor. Well, that's all right, then. I'll go. I think you made a wise decision, Fred. Oh, you're a good man, Joe. I appreciate everything you've done for me. Now, I'd like to do a little something for you. No, no, that's all right, Fred. No, 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 no. It's something I want to do. Now, just let me borrow a pencil and a piece of paper. Thank you. This will only take a minute. Of course, I'm going to keep some for myself. <laughs> sure, that's only fair. You just give this to my lawyer, and he'll take care of all of the details. It's legal, you know. This is not as good as I did for you the last time, but things have been a little tough. I understand, Fred. Thanks. Any time. Good old Fred. Last time he gave you that uranium mine, wasn't it? Yeah, Fred's generous, all right. What is it this time? <laughs> Seven million dollars in stocks and bonds. Don't spend it all in one place. Hospital detail, Gannon. Right. What's his condition? We'll do what we can. Wilshire Division, shooting coming in, code three. Yeah. Victim's got five bullets in him. Doesn't look like he's gonna make it. Uh -huh. Wilshire detectives want a dying declaration. When a person in imminent fear of death makes a voluntary statement, the legal presumption is that he has told the truth. This statement is no longer considered hearsay, but is legally admissible as evidence in court. 11.40 p.m., the ambulance from Wilshire Division arrived. Room one. Mm -hmm. 
Ivy, both arms. if we can. You're John Murphy, are you? Yeah. Sergeant Friday, John, how do you feel? Real bad. I'm not gonna make it. We can get a priest. No, don't bother. Somebody you want notified? Are you married, John? Yeah. But I'm not living with my wife. All right, now, John. Who shot you? I didn't get a good look. Can you tell me what happened? My apartment. Somebody rang the bell. I opened the door, and she... She started shooting. Was it a man or a woman? The light wasn't so good. Wearing slacks. Could have been a young boy. You have a girlfriend, John? All right, now, if you're getting tired, you just nod. Now, do you have a girlfriend? Was she in the apartment with you? Working. Cocktail waitress. Did she shoot you? Your wife? All my fault, anyway. Was it your wife, John? Now, did she shoot you? No pulse, no blood pressure. Did he answer on his wife? He moved his head. Was it a nod, a yes, or a no? I can't honestly say, Joe. Doc. All I can say for sure is the patient died at 11.51 p.m. Fifty-one quitting time. A.M.'s due. Sergeant, found her down at six and Broadway, directing traffic with these. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 23rd, a hearing was held in Department 95, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that hearing. The judge ordered the suspect to be placed under the supervision of the Department of Mental Hygiene for treatment as a mentally ill person. As a result of the coroner's post-mortem, it was determined that the suspect's female companion died of natural causes. 